All right. Welcome, everybody. Settle in. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, my name is John Jacobson, and on behalf of the Department of Mathematics, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the 19th Michael Moody Mathematics Lecture. Michael Moody was a cherished friend, mentor, and inspiration to the Department of Mathematics. Moody came to the college in 1994, and in 1996, he became HMC's first Diana and Kenneth Johnson Professor of Mathematics and was named Chair of the Department. During his time as Chair from 1996 to 2002, the Department hired eight new professors, bringing the total number of math faculty to 12. Moody wanted to hire mathematicians who would inspire students in the classroom and who had a passion for their mathematical work. And indeed, the department credits Mike Moody as a guiding force leading to the reception in 2006 of the inaugural American Mathematical Society Award for exemplary program or achievement in a mathematics department. Mike was a polymath. He received his bachelor's degree from UCSD with a double major in mathematics and chemical physics and a double minor in history and philosophy. Pursuing an interest in the biological systems, he earned his doctorate at the University of Chicago, writing an applied, math applied mathematics thesis in population genetics. He understood the power and beauty of mathematical biology and indeed was instrumental working with Professor Lizette de Pillis in the and the department in creating the mathematical biology major at Harvey Mudd College, one of the first undergraduate institutions to have such a major. How wonderful that tonight's speaker, a leading epidemiologist and scholar in the field, was able to choose this math biology major during her time and to follow the impactful career that she's had. At the time of his death in January 2010, Moody was Vice President for Academic Affairs and founding Dean of Faculty at Olin College. That spring, the HMC Alumni Association recognized Mike Moody as an honorary alumnus to commemorate his manifold contributions and tangible impact on the college. And this Moody Lecture Series was established by the math department to honor Mike's legacy at the college and his appreciation for talks that illuminate the joy, mystery, and applicability of mathematics. And it's supported by gifts from Mike's family, friends, colleagues, and former students. And I would like to recognize and thank Mike's wife, Joni Moody, and daughter, Cheriston Moody, for joining us tonight. Also, while we all wish we could be together in person, one benefit of this virtual event is that it has allowed Mike's sister, Sandra Moody Halter, to join us from Kentucky, Mike's home state, to attend her very first Moody lecture. We're so glad you could be with us here, Sandra, and we welcome everyone all over the world joining us for this talk. Now, let me turn to tonight's speaker. It is an honor for me to be introducing Dr. Nadia Abuelazam, class of 2009, South Dorm Proctor, AE Tutor, Dorm Jock, first generation rock star. Nadia excelled at Harvey Mudd, majoring in mathematical biology. She graduated with high distinction and a trifecta of departmental honors in biology, mathematics, and the humanities, social sciences, and the arts. Her senior thesis, working with professors DePillis and Haushalter, focused on equitable distribution of antiretroviral therapy in resource-constrained countries, Uganda in particular. Dr. Abuelazam went on to earn her doctorate in epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and she's now an assistant professor at Boston College in the Connell School of Nursing. The goals of her research program are to use quantitative methods and novel data streams to better understand inequities in health outcomes and healthcare access in resource poor settings and vulnerable populations. I was very fortunate to be her advisor and professor in several classes, and I recall many far-ranging and fun conversations about life, family, the Bay Area, DEs in the life sciences, graduate schools, and so on. Nadia always pairs her fierce intellect and deep seriousness about her studies with her positive and joyful demeanor and her sheer passion for improving the world through mathematics. As an epidemiologist, she's been very gracious with her time and energy in the public sphere lately including writing broadly accessible articles and being featured as a guest on several national news shows. So we're very fortunate to have her with us tonight. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nadia Abuelazam to present the 19th Moody Lecture. Well, thank you so, so much. I, I am very, very humbled by that very generous introduction. 
uh, I told Professor Jacobson I knew this was serious because he was wearing a suit. So uh, <laughs> I am very, very grateful for this opportunity. And I'm so humbled by the invitation from the mathematics department. And I'd just like to give my thanks to both Professor Jacobson and Professor Benjamin, who've really helped um, both craft the title and also craft some of the ideas uh, that I'll be presenting today. Uh, and I'm really just honored to be able to give back to a community that's given so much to me. Uh, I am and always will be very grateful for my Harvey Mudd experience. And I really don't think uh, I will, I would have been where I am today really without it. Um, and so before I start, I just wanted to provide a little bit of, and let's see if I can advance my slide, a little bit of a preface uh, to my talk today. So I will admit, and I'm going to say it out loud, that when I was asked to speak today, I had a great deal and still have a great deal of imposter syndrome. As a first generation college student, a child of immigrants, um, I feel like I've been learning by looking at what others have done around me, and especially at my time at MUD, uh, and especially when I declared a mathematics major, I didn't necessarily think uh, that I could uh, get where I am today. And so I just hope that this message that I do feel quite a bit of imposter syndrome may motivate, inspire, or encourage students who may be deciding about declaring a mathematics major, may be unsure, um, or just may be unsure about where their Harvey Mudd education can lead them. I hope that you'll have faith in the process, and I hope that you'll uh, really just enjoy every moment of your time there. I do believe that the community at Harvey Mudd is like no other, um, and I'm very, very grateful for everyone uh, who really shaped my time at Harvey Mudd and beyond. Um, and I am very, very fortunate to be speaking to you all today. Um, I know it's a very difficult time. I know that our time is uh, sort of being pulled in so many different directions for so many different reasons during this pandemic. And so I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your time with me today. And I hope that through my reflections, uh, we may together learn a little bit more about how inequity uh, occurs, what the effects of inequity are in our country, and also how we might be able to take a peek at some of this using mathematics. Um, and I will say that the ideas in this talk have been motivated by not only some of my own thoughts about what's happening with COVID-19, uh, but also uh, from a lot of people that I've been discussing these ideas with. So while nothing in this talk is revolutionary or groundbreaking, I do hope that I'm presenting it in a way that's accessible to the larger population. So I think it goes without saying, that we're in the middle of one of the largest public health and any type of crisis really uh, that we've ever experienced here in the United States. Uh, the data as of yesterday, um, there were over 8.2 million reported cases in the United States and over 220,000 deaths due to COVID-19. And these are really uh, staggering numbers and they're especially upsetting because as uh, us epidemiologists know all infectious disease cases and deaths are completely preventable. What's particularly concerning at this moment in time is the current uh, reporting of new cases in the United States. And what you'll notice is that we're seeing a very uh, strong uptick in cases um, in the past few weeks. And what was particularly concerning about what happened in the spring was the exponential rise in the number of cases that were occurring across the country. We saw a similar exponential rise in the summer, and unfortunately, I think we're on the precipice of another exponential rise in cases. If there is a silver lining in all of this, which I think is very hard to argue, our death rate is actually stabilizing. Um, and I believe that that is likely due to the fact that we've gotten a lot better at treating COVID-19 and preventing potential death due to COVID-19. All of this, though, uh, points, and, and it, I would be remiss not to say that the effects of COVID-19 are not being felt equally or equitably across the United States population. And in fact, there is evidence that there are particular communities in our country that are experiencing differential outcomes due to the coronavirus. And those are communities of color. So the data that I'm showing here on this graph comes from the APM Research Lab, uh, 
They developed a report called The Color of Coronavirus, which I would highly recommend uh, you look at if you're interested in this. And what is being plotted here is the cumulative uh, mortality rate per 100,000 uh, that is segregated by race and ethnicity. And what we see here in this plot is that Black individuals in the United States have the highest mortality rate, followed by Indigenous populations, followed by Pacific Islanders, Latinos, and then whites and Asians. And we see that there's a slight protective effect on mortality for Asians. And just to give you a little bit more context into some of these numbers, what these numbers tell us is that one in every 920 Black Americans has died of the coronavirus. One in every 1,110 Indigenous Americans has died of the coronavirus. One in every 1,360 Latino Americans have died of the coronavirus. And these are really, really staggering numbers. They're particularly upsetting numbers. And as an epidemiologist, I think the first question that comes to mind is why are communities of color experiencing a higher rate of not only infection, but also severity and mortality. And public health uh, researchers, epidemiologists have been thinking about this question for quite a while. And there are some risk factors um, that communities of color are um, at higher risk for. Some of these uh, include healthcare access and utilization. There are different patterns among communities of color than white communities. There are particular occupational hazards that affect communities of color more often. Things like crowding in um, occupations, uh, not being able to wear protective gear, and not having proper safety uh, and mechanisms in place for prevention. Differences in educational income and wealth, and also differences in housing, both quality and location. And these are what we would call the social determinants of health. These are the social aspects of one's life that will in some way influence your ability to be well and healthy, whether that's mental, physical, or emotional wellness. But what we also know and what we've come to accept as a larger public health community is that the underlying mechanism that has created differences in healthcare access, occupational hazards, housing, or education is actually a force that's been in our country for hundreds of years, and in fact, has been in our country since its inception, and that is racism. Racism is the underlying cause of these social determinants, of the differences in these social determinants among communities of color and white communities in the United States. And today in my talk, I'll be talking about how we can better understand the effects of racism on health outcomes using causal inference and a counterfactual framework. Before I go on though, I'd like to provide definitions for race and racism, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page and understanding. So race, uh, as defined here, is a social construct that's been developed over time to categorize humans by their often physical appearance and most commonly their skin color. And that is uh, something that we see and we are actually exposed to quite often in forms. We're asked to check a race that's often white, black, Asian, uh, and in some cases, Latino or Hispanic is included as either an ethnicity or a race. But it's important to note that race is a social construct. Race has no biological basis. We've mapped the human genome. We know that the differences between races is minimal, if not, not non-existent. And so race is a social construct that's been developed um, in order to create systems of power and oppression in the United States. And one of those systems is the system or the force of racism. And so racism is the use of the construction of race to lift up certain groups and to keep other groups in lower and oppressed classes. And it's important to note that racism is a double-sided coin, meaning some people will actually be harmed by racism 
while others will actually benefit from racism. And the type of racism that I'm gonna focus most of my discussion on today is structural racism. Structural racism are the ways in which our society fosters and reinforces discrimination in the beliefs, values, and distribution of resources using systems that are present like housing, education, employment, earnings, so on and so forth. And again, it's important to note that racism is not just a historical concept, not just something that happened in the past, but something that continues to inform people's health even uh, on today. I've been thinking very closely about the concept and the structures of racism that influence people's exposure to particular infectious diseases. And I recently wrote a grant to the National Institute of Health to better understand ways in which we can study racism as a construct using mathematical modeling. So this was the theoretical framework I proposed in my grant application, where racism actually informs a number of processes that we would normally model in a mathematical model. And those processes go on to, um, to affect three different things, differential exposure to infectious diseases, differential susceptibility and severity, and then differential disease consequences. And we know that all three of these things lead to differentials in both incidence, prevalence, and mortality of infectious diseases. So while this pathway that I've illustrated here is specific to infectious diseases, it's important to note that racism is actually a part of the causal pathway for a number of different types of outcomes and different types of diseases. And I will just say that it may be easy to imagine some of those intermediate social determinants that are affected by racism. Some others that you may not normally think about are things like redlining or segregation that happens both in housing and education. Things like occupational and environmental exposures and hazards, the fact that low-income housing often is actually placed near environmental waste sites and dumps. Things like psychosocial trauma, where discrimination, microaggressions, and exposure to racist media coverage can actually affect the mental health of individuals over time. So again, I just want to emphasize here that we view racism as the structural cause of many of these social determinants here represented in blue that go on to affect exposure, susceptibility, and mortality in infectious diseases. So I was particularly struck by this statement that the APM report listed, to go back to our uh, current crisis in coronavirus, they stated if they had died of coronavirus, or COVID-19 rather, at the same rate as white Americans, 21,800 Black, 11,400 Latino, 750 Indigenous, and 65 Pacific Islander Americans would still be alive today. And to me, this is a very powerful and very striking statement. And it's a statement that I'm gonna come back to later on in the talk, um, because this is a use of counterfactuals to get a very important point across about health disparities. And as epidemiologists, we are concerned about these health disparities because our role as epidemiologists is to study the distribution and determinants of health-related states and events in specified populations. And what I mean by distribution, excuse me, is I mean frequencies and patterns. And what I mean by determinants, I, I really mean and, and hope to mean causes. What causes different health outcomes in a particular society? And the reason why we're concerned with figuring out what causes a variety of health outcomes is because when we've identified a cause, we know that we can intervene on that cause. We know that we can go in and make a change that may actually improve people's health in the long term. So when I read statistics like those that I've read in the APM report that, that state and clearly show that communities of color have uh, been experiencing the burden of COVID-19 in the United States, my first question is what causes that increased risk of COVID-19 in communities of color? And is that cause 
something to do with their race. Specifically, I probably will give the answer away now, is that cause really racism? So what I hope to do in the next part of the talk is to provide you with a counterfactual framework that will require just a tad bit of mathematics, really simple mathematics, that will help us understand how it is that we determine what is or is not a cause when thinking about health outcomes uh, for epidemiological research. So let's start with a very simple toy example. And with this simple toy example, you'll get to know a little bit about my NBA preferences. So let's say that Steph Curry, who if you don't know, shame on you, but anyways, he is uh, of the Golden State Warriors. Let's say Steph was walking across the street and did not use the crosswalk. And let's also say that Steph sustains an injury from oncoming traffic. This is a simple situation, right? He doesn't use a crosswalk and he gets injured. But let's say we have some magical or divine power that allows us to see what would have happened had Steph actually used the crosswalk. And using our divine or magical power, we know that if Steph used the crosswalk, he would not have sustained an injury from oncoming traffic. If I told you this story, if I told even uh, a young person this story, they might come to the conclusion that not using a crosswalk might lead to injury. That is, the use of a crosswalk has a causal effect on getting injured by oncoming traffic. So this is what we would term, what we would deem causal inference, trying to determine if there's a causal effect, if there's a relationship between some outcome or action that's been taken and some, sorry, some action that's been taken and some outcome, excuse me. And usually we don't have divine and magical powers. So we're actually only able to view or see one of these two different scenarios. But if we were able to see both of these scenarios, we would be able to say something about the causal relationship between the action taken and the outcome observed, which in this simple example is using a crosswalk and getting injured. So let's set up some notation. Let's assume that we, and this is a big assumption, that our treatment variable is dichotomous. There's only two options for the treatment variable, and let's call it A for action. And in this particular case, we'll designate one as not using a crosswalk and zero as using a crosswalk. And let's also say we only have two options for our outcome variable where one is getting injured and zero is not getting injured. And these variables, A and Y, are random variables and they differ for each individual that we might look at. So our notation that we're going to use for the outcomes that we observe is Y of A equals one is the outcome variable observed under treatment A equals one. And note here that a lowercase a represents the value of a particular random variable for a particular individual. And y of a equals zero is the outcome vari variable observed when a equals zero. So in Steph's case, when he didn't use the crosswalk and he got injured, his value was y of a equals one equals one, whereas when we magically know that when he did use the crosswalk, he did not sustain injuries, he had a y of a equals zero of zero. And based on our first example, we know that there will be a causal effect if the value of y is different under the condition a equals one and a equals zero. And again, it becomes very clear here that we don't usually get to see both values of y. We usually only get to observe one value of y in real life. And, that, and because of that, we usually can almost never estimate a causal effect for an individual because we usually do not have our magical divine powers to be able to look at um, our magic eight ball and see what would have happened. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize here that while we're talking about this specific example, we can think of any exposure A and any outcome Y. So the counterfactuals in this example, what I'm going to refer to as counterfactuals, are the variables that occurred. So the outcome 
when A equals one and A equals zero, because they're both potential outcomes. They represent situations that may not actually occur because only one is factual. Only one corresponds to some real life occurrence. And that makes, uh, you know, I view counterfactuals as almost this magical quantity that really do rely a bit on our imagination. So what we normally can observe, or at least under some very strict conditions, is actually um, not the individual causal effect, but the average causal effect in a group or a population. So let's imagine that we managed to recruit a part of the Golden State rosters team. And using our magical powers, we can see both counterfactual situations for every member of the team. So in our table here, we've listed the last names of the Golden State Warriors. And then we've also listed our counterfactual outcomes in the situation where the Warriors, the Warrior player does not use the crosswalk and the situation where the Warrior player does use the crosswalk. And again, our Y values, one means injured and zero means not injured. And we can look then to see what the probability of sustaining an injury is when you don't use the crosswalk and that's five out of 10, so 50% probability of sustaining an injury when you don't use a crosswalk. And you can also look at the probability of sustaining an injury when you do use the crosswalk. And among this particular sample, it's also 50%. And so we see that there is no difference in the risk of sustaining injury, regardless of whether or not you used a crosswalk. So normally we would say there would be an average causal effect a would have a causal effect on Y if the probability for the counterfactual when A equals one was not equal to the probability of the counterfactual when A equals zero. And we can look at this as an expectation because really we would be averaging over the entire group of people here. And I just wanna say for those of you who are interested in the properties, the absence of an average causal effect does not imply the absence of individual effects here. Um, so there are a number of properties associated with this average causal effect measure. Um, and I will also say that there are a lot of nuances that I'm skipping over here. We could imagine instead of saying that we just recruited the Golden State Warriors, that we would sample the Warriors as a representation of the NBA in which case we could look at the sample probabilities and we could view them as estimators of the corresponding population estimate. But I'm, again, just simplifying this example for those who are um, interested, there is a lot more nuance associated here. Again, it is very unlikely that we will be able to observe both counterfactuals. We won't be able to, to look at both of these columns realistically in the real world. So realistically, we would only actually be able to observe one A value and one Y value for each individual. And this is much more like what might happen if we were looking at uh, a trial or a survey or any type of study result. So again, this table is different. Each individual only has one A value and one Y value. So there's been a change in um, the way that we're presenting the data here. And by making this change, we're also going to not make as many strong conclusions as we did before. We may not actually be able to say that A causes Y in this situation. So let's look at some numbers. Among five individuals who did not use the sidewalk, three sustained injuries. And you'll notice that my notation has changed here. It's the probability of Y equals one given A equals one. So that's about 60%. So, six, so the risk of getting injured, given you did not use this crosswalk, was about 60%. And we can't really use the word cause here because we don't have information on the counterfactual. And this is true for counterfactual theory. So Y and A are dependent or associated here because the probability of Y equals one given A equals one is not equal to the probability of Y equals one given A equals zero. And again, you can look at the expectation here when looking at a group. So the question then becomes, when can you make a causal argument and when can you make 
an associative argument. In our particular example, we found no average causal effect, but we did find an association. Um, and we only were able to find the average causal effect because we used some magic uh, to be able to determine um, what would have happened um, in a different universe, in a different situation. And I think for me, the figure on the right here really does help highlight this difference. If we have a population of interest that is receiving some sort of treatment or exposure here, Usually, using counterfactual theory, the only way we could really establish causation is if we were able to see the two different counterfactuals where one group experienced the exposure and that same exact group also experienced not exposure. Whereas for associational differences, you're able to observe those among those who received treatment and among those who did not receive treatment. The difference here is that we're comparing the same people when looking at a causal difference, whereas for association, we're comparing two different groups of people. The ultimate goal, again, of whether it's causation or association is really to improve health. And I think the argument that's been made in the epidemiology literature of late is that causal inference is obviously much stronger than associational inference. And that if we were to show that something like uh, using the sidewalk caused a decrease in injuries, we would know exactly where to intervene. We would have a very specific uh, sort of charge to intervene in developing sidewalks. Um, but I don't think that all questions are really as straightforward as that toy example. So what's the closest we can get to a counterfactual in the real world? And this is actually where a lot of epidemiological theory comes in as well, because we know that if we have a perfectly randomized trial where we randomly, we have a group of folks and we randomly pick one group to receive treatment, and then we because we randomly chose one, the second half is randomized to not receive treatment. And what that randomization actually does is it ensures in some way that those two groups should be on average similar because of the randomization. And so we may actually be able to assess causation if we assume that on average, those two groups are similar. They are essentially as if it was two alternate realities, the same group of people receiving treatment and the same group of people not receiving treatment. This is a big assumption. It's called the exchangeability assumption. And there's actually very few trials that are truly randomized. There's a number of reasons why randomization can break. Um, but really when we think about randomization, it is as close as we can get in the real world to developing a situation where we have two separate counterfactuals. So oftentimes in counterfactual theory, one way to assess whether or not um, you can determine whether your particular exposure of interest is a cause is to decide if you can feasibly design an intervention that you could use in a randomized trial. So for our example, the, our example research question, does not using a, site, a crosswalk cause injury, we would have to randomly require half of the MBA to not use the crosswalk and half of the MBA to use a crosswalk and then observe whether or not they got injured. And I think you would agree that this trial probably wouldn't work. It's very hard to force people uh, to do things like, you know, walking on a crosswalk. Um, but I think this exercise of trying to imagine an intervention in a randomized trial can help you better determine whether or not something can actually have a counterfactual example and therefore be determined to be a causal effect. So let's go back, as I promised you, to our statement that was made by the APM research group. If they had died of COVID at the same rate as white, of, as white Americans, this many Black, Latino, Indigenous, and Pacific Islander Americans would still be alive. Another way to say this, the counterfactual way of saying this is, if Black, Latino, Indigenous, and Pacific Islander Americans were white Americans, this many fewer individuals would have died. That is a counterfactual statement. 
But I think you would agree that it's not a very well-defined counterfactual statement. There is no way to change someone's race. There is no way to design a randomized control trial where race is the exposure. And so that raises the question, can race be a cause of these differential health outcomes? And things that we would consider thinking about to answer that question is, are, can we conduct a randomized trial with race as the exposure or treatment? Is race a well-defined intervention? Which I think I've answered both of those questions uh, to be no, and I think you would agree. The last question is a really important one. Would this actually be a helpful determination? What could we do with this information? So if we could assign race as we would treatment, would that actually be helpful to solving this problem? And because we can't change people's race, I would argue that this would actually not be a helpful determination. And I will say that this question, can race be a cause, has been debated in the epidemiological literature and is continuing to be debated in the epidemiological literature. Um, it comes back to a lot of theory and it also comes back to our understanding of what race is and how it functions in society. And I hope that I convinced you at the beginning of this talk that it's not race, but actually racism that's impacting people's health in really substantial ways. So a question I would pose here as a follow-up is, can racism be a cause of health? And these are the questions, again, that we would ask ourselves. Can we conduct a randomized trial with racism as the exposure or treatment? And I would argue that you could come up with ideas or examples of ways in which you could change the treatment, the historical and present treatment that someone experiences in a counterfactual situation. It may be hard to wrap your brain around it, but I think it's a little bit easier to wrap your brain around than race. Is racism a well-defined intervention? I think if we all sat down and put our heads together, we may be able to come up with an intervention definition. It's still a little bit difficult. But I think this third question is what really sells it for me. Would this actually be a helpful determination? Would knowing that racism is a cause help us change people's health? And I would argue that because of that last question, because my answer to this last question is yes, that the conversation about racism as a cause, I believe that's the reason why this conversation has really shifted forward over this year, but also in the past few years. And so in the public health literature and the epidemiological literature, we do consider structural racism in particular to be a specific cause for a variety of health outcomes. And remember that the definition of racism and structural racism here is how interconnected institutions and um, beliefs really do change the way that systems, resources are distributed in society. So what would this look like? What would, if we believe that racism is a cause of health, what would this look like in terms of a development of an intervention to address racism? Well, there actually have been a number of interventions that have been developed to address this. But before I go into that example, I just want to return back to Steph Curry. I don't want to leave him be. I want to let him know that one potential solution to the issue we were describing before would be to update city plans to include safe crosswalks for all. So let's not make it an individual choice whether or not you use the crosswalk. Let's make sure that you have access to the crosswalk, <laughs> regardless of whether or not you do or do not want to use it. Let's put a crosswalk there and make sure that you have access with it. And I think that that's the general sense of what these structural interventions for racism really are about. The real world example I want to tell you about is a purpose-built community um, being um, done right now in Atlanta, Georgia. The goal of this intervention was to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty. And they did this by building communities that had highly high quality construction, safe walkways and streets, cradle to college educational curriculum, and they also managed to promote healthy behaviors and employment. And what they saw in this particular community is that crime declined by 95% 
employment increased from 13 to 70 percent, and there were a number of positive health outcomes, including a reduction in chronic health outcomes associated with individuals who participated in this community. This intervention is not cheap. <laughs> And some may argue it's not a feasible intervention to implement you know, nationwide, but it's doable because it's place-based, it's multi-sectoral, and it's an equity-oriented initiative. And it not only impacts health outcomes, but it goes to impact all of those social determinants that I mentioned before that were affected by racism in the first place. So again, I think the goal here is to really make sure that we're attributing these causes to structures and symptoms and not putting the responsibility on individuals. We build crosswalks. We don't tell people to change their behaviors about crossing the street. Education is always important. It's a, it's a process and it's an important complement to building crosswalks, but education alone will not change the outcomes associated with using crosswalks, just like we need to change the structures and systems in place in society in order to change individual behavior and then to change individual outcomes ultimately. Again, I think it's really important as public health professionals, as those of us who are interested in, in changing the health of populations, to really think about not only where we're putting the blame, but where we're putting the responsibility of change um, in terms of how it is that we create change due to not only the structural causes of racism, but all the other isms that we have in society. And this actually was highlighted earlier in the spring. Not sure if you all remember this, but um, in, er in early April, the Surgeon General actually made a statement to the nation and he essentially encouraged people and specifically speaking to people of color to avoid alcohol, tobacco and drugs. And Communities of color really felt like this was a personal attack on their um, decisions and their health behaviors, and it was not putting the responsibility on the systems that created those health disparities. And I think, again, this is going to be a conversation that we have again and again as we move forward. So I, the things that I hope that you'll take away from this exploration of causal inference and counterfactuals are that it's really hard to prove something is a cause. And in fact, oftentimes it requires some magic or divine information in order to see both types of counterfactuals. But even though we aren't able to have counterfactuals for all situations, that doesn't mean that we can't work to create change. And I actually believe that this conversation we're having in epidemiology about whether or not race is a cause is actually just pushing the can down the road. It's actually just moving the responsibility of creating change to the next generation. Because realistically, if we believe that racism is a cause, we need to be able to act on it now. And I do believe, as Audre Lorde's quote says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. We need to develop new tools new methodologies, new mathematical theories that will help us move the information that we have to impact people's health and to improve their lives. So I'd like to pause there. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you again for the opportunity. And I hope that we can engage in conversation through the question and answer. Thank you all. Thank you, Nadia. Wow, uh, such a timely and thought-provoking talk. Um, you show us all the importance of being clear on our definitions to shape our work and, and move society forward. So we have time for questions, please. All right, so we have a question here. Uh, going back to your discussion about attributing causes to structures and systems, could you provide an example of which structures or systems should or could be changed for the better? Sure, this is a great question. And I think one thing that has gotten actually a lot of attention lately is um, the way in which housing segregation um, 
happens in the United States and how it can be undone to improve not only people's health, but also educational opportunities. So redlining is a very common practice in the United States. Um, it's usually done for political purposes to gain certain vo votes in particular counties or states. And oftentimes what this results in is um, communities of color are forced to live in more impoverished areas or areas where there aren't as many resources or high quality educational outcomes. So one system that we could address is residential redlining, the way in which we determine where people live and the reasons which we put certain groups of people in certain um, areas and systems. Another uh, example related to that is where we put our environmental toxic waste sites, where we put our environmental dump sites. When you look at the data, when you look at the maps, these sites are almost always placed near low income housing or near communities of color. That's a purposeful example, a purposeful decision that was made that harms the health of these populations. Um, so those are just two examples of systems or structures that can actually be changed through policy ma making, through decision making that may actually impact people's health. That's a great to transition into the next question uh, from Meredith Rawls. Mm -hmm. Do you have recommendations about what policies we should advocate for to address systemic racism as a public health issue? Yeah, thanks, Meredith. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, I think there are so many and it's really hard to um, narrow them down. I think generally it's become much more widely accepted that racism is a public health issue. It's being accepted not only by um, hospitals and clinicians, but also by governments. I believe we're at about 30 states that have declared racism as a public health issue. I think things that you can think about doing related to voting, which is coming up very soon, thinking about um, the policies um, that you're voting for related to education, policies you're voting for related to um, occupations and the types of benefits that people receive in those occupations, whether or not we're paying attention to workplace safety and health in these settings, I think is really important. Um, and I think also, um, I think it can become overwhelming when we think about trying to change the structures and systems in which we live. And so I encourage you to define communities according to what's comfortable for you. Perhaps a community that you can make tangible change and action in is your own neighborhood. Perhaps if you have children in school, it might be that particular school or that particular school district. I think the way that we define community and the, the level of impact that we can make um, can actually be very different for each individual. And I think you can make a lot of lasting change at very local community levels. Um, and that may feel more tangible for people than thinking about how to change redlining in the United States. That's great. As, as those of you who know Sumi Pendiker always said, be an agent of change in your sphere of influence. Right. Okay, next question uh, from Nick. What evidence is there, as studies or statistics, that racism is the cause? It sounds more like race is a correlating factor. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I'm really glad that you asked this question because I think it sort of gets at the core of the argument I was trying to make, which is that it may be much easier to look at race in statistical models. In fact, I've published papers that look at differences of health outcomes by different racial or ethnic groups. That's a very easy analysis to do. It doesn't require um, too much statistical skill, but it is just an association. It is just a correlation. I agree that, sh that having hard line evidence that racism is the cause is quite difficult because again, racism even precedes a lot of the measures that we use to um, define health. So racism precedes education level, racism precedes income level, racism precedes housing. And we usually use education, income, and housing as the variables in our model to try to assess um, causation or association. There is though, um, and I am happy to, to distribute a paper that was recently published um, about how structural racism specifically has been shown to be a cause. And it does look at these systems like redlining, like uh, environmental toxins, 
Um, and it aims, again, to not use necessarily the counterfactual definition of causal inference. I've only shown you one theory, one framework, um, but aims to use a different framework for causation to do that. So I think the, the counterfactual framework is a very difficult framework to prove, prove causation with, um, especially for, it, for situations like racism. Um, but there is actually um, quite a bit of work that's been put into um, trying to understand how racism is a cause of a number of health outcomes. I agree that um, race is almost always a correlating factor in our public health studies, um, but I believe that the public health community is moving away from discussing race and towards racism. A lot of great questions coming in. Keep them coming, everyone. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. Uh, next, I'd like to ask, in, 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 the question is, in what ways, if any, have you seen equity or inequity being included in COVID-19 forecast models? Hmm, interesting. Yeah, um, <laughs> I also wrote a grant um, to do just this um, to the NIH. Um, I don't know if I don't know that a ton of forecast models have incorporated race and ethnicity and racism as factors. And I believe, and I believe this is largely due to the types of data that we have available to us. I don't know if you all know this, but back at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, most states were actually not stratifying their COVID data by race and ethnicity. That only became a norm late in the spring. And even then most states were not publicly reporting their data by race and ethnicity. And in fact, the New York Times, which has become the central data hub for coronavirus, actually had to sue to get access to COVID-19 data stratified by race and ethnicity. So I think the question is spot on. I don't think race and ethnicity is being used a ton in prediction models. And I think that that stems from the fact that data is often not available stratified by race and ethnicity to get at the causal or even the associational mechanisms that we're chatting about here. Okay, the next question I'd like to bring up is, um, what are your thoughts on the parallels between the HIV AIDS pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of how these disproportionately affect communities of color? Yeah, I've thought about a lot this a lot and we had a good discussion about this in our MUD talks earlier um, in the year. Um, I think what we're seeing is at the beginning of the HIV AIDS pandemic, um, HIV was primarily a disease that affected white gay men. And it's only been in the past five or so years that the pandemic and the epidemic in the United States specifically has shifted more towards communities of color and specifically communities of color in the Southern part of the United States. And the reason for that shift that's often attributed, uh, the things that are attributed to that shift are related to access to healthcare. So whether or not folks are actually able to access tests and access preventative measures and access treatments. Um, and I also think that it's related to a lot of uh, stigma associated um, with particular behaviors um, in communities of color in the United States. I think um, what the coronavirus epidemic has really uh, exposed. It's not something new. We know, and in, fa in fact, for most infectious diseases in the United States, communities of color uh, do far worse than white communities. So this is not a new pattern, but I think what the coronavirus pa uh, pandemic has done is really expose this to be a pattern um, that is not just due to stigma. And I think that that's actually a really big difference with the HIV pandemic. This has very little to do with stigma, has very little to do with um, you know, behaviors that are normally stigmatized in populations. This has everything to do with the ways in which people live, work, and play. And the conditions in which people live, work, and play in communities of color is very different than the conditions in white communities. And I think that that, for me, coronavirus has really brought that out to the forefront. And um, I think it's done that a little bit differently than for HIV because of the lack of um, stigmatizing behavior that is present in many of our communities around the reasons for HIV transmission. Thank you. Okay, the next question, uh, slightly different angle. Uh, I'm involved with a number of Black board members focused on health equity. What advice do you have for us on building the business case and the economic rational for investing in improving health equity? <laughs> 
Well, first of all, thank you for your work. That sounds like really important work. Um, and I hope that you'll continue to do that. I actually was attending a talk last night by Dr. Kamara Jones, um, who was the former president of the Public Health Association and the Medical Association. And she made a really interesting argument about how um, everyone really does suffer from racism. It's not just communities of color that suffer from racism. White communities also suffer from racism because ultimately the way that our health insurance system is uh, set up, the way our healthcare system is set up, healthcare costs rise when there are particular communities that are um, using the healthcare system more. Your health insurance premiums will rise if people are accessing um, more, more treatment, more, um, more therapy, whatever it might be. And so I think you could make an argument about the costs related to healthcare associated with these disparities affecting not only communities of color, but affecting all of us um, through our insurance premiums, also through our tax dollars paying for these public health systems and also the med Medicare systems. So I think the economic argument I would make would be about the cost of healthcare in this particular um, setting. Thank you. Okay, the next question uh, from Professor DePillis. Can you say something more about the successful Atlanta Community with Purpose effort? Are there elements of that endeavor that can be fairly easily exported to other communities? Yeah, I actually think there are. I think people get really intimidated when they hear about the level of intervention that was done in terms of the amount of money that was put into to building this community. But we can actually pull out elements of that intervention and see how that works. So, for example, cradle to college education systems. How are we investing in the educational success of children of color in the United States? Are there ways that we can develop programs and instill programs in communities that do not normally have access to these programs? Um, pulling out any aspect of that intervention, I think would be effective at changing some aspect of health outcomes and even other educational workplace um, livelihood outcomes as well. Um, I don't think the argument is to build these communities across the country. I think the argument is what can we change in the way in which our cities are built, right? Um, how is it that we can plan our cities, build our cities to better uh, serve the residents of those cities? And I think we have to think not only about the built environment, right? Do people have opportunities to safely walk and run? Are there green spaces and parks? but also about the um, aspects of the environment that foster education and health. Um, so I think definitely aspects of that um, can be applied elsewhere. Thanks, Professor DePillis. <laughs> uh, next question, um, what are some strategies we can use when faced with the argument that it isn't a scientist's place to engage with social issues such as structural racism? Oh boy, um, <laughs> we were actually talking about this before we started, um, I, I, you know, I don't really buy that argument because in reality, um, if you think about the types of questions that we're interested in as scientists, those questions can and will be made political. And I think the coronavirus pandemic has really just, just really made that very bare, that even public health decisions, what is deemed a scientific fact has become a political question. And so I would argue that it would be irresponsible not to engage in those conversations. As individuals with our training, with our background, uh, we need to use the science and the facts to counteract a lot of um, these claims that this isn't scientific or this isn't real. Um, and unfortunately, you know, one scientist can't do that alone. It requires a whole community to step up and to really start making these arguments. And it's not an argument, right? If we're, if we're using, it is an argument, but we're using scientific fact to back up that argument. And I think that's what makes it stronger. Um, and, you know, I don't hesitate about it. I know it might be uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable at first, but I think the more you talk about these issues and you incorporate them into your work, the easier it becomes. Uh, next question, as an epidemiologist, how do you balance your role as a scientist with your role as an advocate and an activist? <laughs> Somewhat related. <laughs> this is a huge question right now in the epidemiology community, actually. So we have a big community on Twitter. It's a hashtag EpiTwitter. 
And there has been a, a very vibrant debate lately. Are epidemiology, are epidemiologists activists? Should they be activists? And there is one camp that clearly that clearly believes that epidemiologists have to be advocates because our role is to improve population health. And one way to do that is to be an advocate for these populations to either get out of poverty or to um, you know, gain treatment, gain access to treatment. Um, and then another camp um, is really about you know, making sure that we're sticking to the science, sticking to the studies. Um, and I think it's, you know, while it is a debate, I do fall more on the activist side, clearly, uh, from my talk. Um, I do think that it would be a missed opportunity if we were to do these studies and if we were to do our analyses, if we didn't use our platform to advocate for the populations that we're trying to help. Um, if we're not doing that, I don't really see the point or the ultimate goal of the work that we're doing. Okay, now we have a question coming from a student, uh, current student. What can we do as STEM students to change our fields and the conversation around racial equity? Great question. Um, I would say that it's not solely your responsibility as students. I hope that there are changes happening at the school structural department levels that are encouraging faculty to diversify their syllabi to make sure that we're having representation, um, not only in the types of readings and materials that we're providing, but also the types of ideas that we're teaching to our students. But I think as students, one role or responsibility that you can have is to ask for it, right? Ask for um, these topics to be brought up in class. Um, make sure that you're asking questions that have societal ramifications. And I think one thing I learned about the time, my time specifically at MUD was um, don't be afraid to ask questions because oftentimes the most interesting conversations in class result from those questions that are being asked. And in fact, I think uh, as a professor now, I welcome it when a student actually takes me off of my planned route of a lecture because oftentimes that leads to more learning. So I would say ask for it um, and really do ask the questions that you know, the professor may not even be thinking about it in that moment, but by asking that question, it might provide them with an opportunity to come back to you with uh, different information or, or information that might help you get to your, the answer to your question. All right, if you could have your ideal data set for tracking COVID-19 outcomes, Ooh. what are those ideal data sets? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> I think uh, real time is really important. So being able to see the data and, and get access to the data in real time, which would require us to have much faster uh, tests and test results available. I think having that data stratified by a number of factors, but most especially age, which you'd actually be surprised how few states are reporting stratified data by age, um, age, race, ethnicity, um, and then I also would love some GPS or zip code related data to allow me to look at the ge geographic specific indicators that might be influencing um, coronavirus outcomes. I think one thing we're seeing is a huge difference in the types of policies that are being implemented across states. And this is leading to differential outcomes across states. Um, and so I think the geography piece is actually a very important component. Um, so I don't think I'm being too greedy. I think that that's, that's all, relatively feasible um, for most states to do real time, uh, highly stratified by age, race, ethnicity, and then some sort of zip code or even a GPS coordinate would be fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, next question, are there other tools that can be used to infer causation? Uh, if so, what are the benefits of counterfactuals over other methods? Yeah, there are definitely other tools. I only presented one theory here, the counterfactual theory. Um, and I like the counterfactual theory, and this may be a very selfish thing, but I think it helped me use my imagination a little bit more. And, um, you know, I was very struck um, by Professor Sue's book um, that he recently published because I think he talks about this idea of mathematics um, having some sort of wonder associated with it. There's, there's an imagination that's required, and that's what I sort of see happening with counterfactuals. Um, I really do like that imaginative component because it allows us to really think about what could be 
Um, and that's a very interesting question to me that I like to explore. Next one is, how do you incorporate the physical toll that racism takes on people of color? I know there's been a lot of research lately related to long-term effects of stress associated with dealing with racism. Great question. Yes, there has been a lot of research done, not only on the physical toll. So what we know is that um, even interpersonal racism, so microaggressions or experiences of racism in the day, have actually been related to elevated blood pressures that do not actually decrease later in the day. So um, experiencing a microaggression or experiencing racism can actually elevate and sustain a high blood pressure for people of color. And we also know that there's been documented mental health outcomes associated um, with racism. Um, we also know um, that there are maternal health outcomes associated with racism in the United States. Um, mothers who um, are Black have much higher maternal mortality and infant mortality. Um, and a very interesting study, which if we have time, I'll describe very briefly, aimed to really get at the, the idea that racism was the cause of these infant mortality rates. And the way that they did this study is they looked at the infant mortality rates for women who came from Africa and the Caribbean to the United States. So they are first generation immigrants and they had children. And they compared the infant mortality rates of those women to their daughters who were born in the United States and had children. And what they found is that the women who were born in the United States, despite the fact that they were related to those mothers, there wasn't sort of any genetic susceptibility to this, actually had higher infant mortality rates for their children than their mothers who were born outside the United States. And that study really showed us that it was about the lived experience of being born in the United States and living in the United States as a Black woman that influenced her maternal outcomes and her infant health outcomes. And to me, that's one of the most powerful examples of how racism affects um, physical health in the U.S. Thank you. Uh, next question from Rick Hertzberg, class of 68. Hey, good to see you here, Rick. Many conditions interact with each other. Do you know of examples where epi studies have included those interactions? So treating the conditions in aggregate and not just one by one, such as let's say air pollution and COVID-19 respiratory severity. Yes. yes. Actually, there was when these interactions occur, the methods become a little bit more complex have I frozen? You froze for a brief minute, but I think so, but now you're oh, back. Okay, so I am back now. Um, yeah, so there, there was, I'll repeat myself. There was a recent study published that looked at the effects of um, environmental pollution on COVID-19 outcomes among communities of color. And so now we have two intersecting forces and the methods become slightly more complicated to try to de-aggregate those forces, but there are definitely methods and methodologists who are working on interacting and intersecting um, forces that influence health. Um, and I think that that's what really makes the field of epidemiology so interesting is that, you know, it's not as simple as the example I provided you with. There are always going to be confounders. There's always going to be modifiers to that situation. And that's where the math and the complexity becomes really fun. Uh, next question, might it also be the case that there are differentials in treatment, that race may impact how patients are diagnosed, triaged, and treated, um, not just susceptibility or exposure? Absolutely. So that's actually the last um, square in my theoretical framework. The first one was exposure, the second one was susceptibility and severity, and the third one was consequences of disease. And I incorporate access to treatment and treatment, and specifically the quality of the treatment that communities of color experience. Because what we know is that even if you access treatment at the same hospital as a white person, the quality of treatment that you experience may be uh, substantially less than the quality that a white patient gets. That's often due to interpersonal racism on behalf sometimes of the provider, but it could also be due to sort of the amount of time you're given in that clinical setting, the type of appointments that you're given, which types of providers you see, um, so definitely treatment is a huge issue. And I think this comes back, I, I teach at a school of nursing. And so we're having a lot of conversations now about what it is about our nursing education that we can change, that we can update to improve the health outcomes of communities of color. 
And one very simple example is that in medical school and nursing schools, oftentimes the, the pictures, the medical dummies, um, the examples that folks are shown in the classroom are often examples of white bodies with white skin tones. And so when you have a, a person of color coming into your clinic as a new medical graduate or a nursing graduate, you may not have actually had exposure to treating uh, a, a body of color. Um, and so it really comes back to how are we training our clinicians um, to be able to properly um, treat and serve our populations of color. Well, Nadia, um, a lot of great questions and we thank you all, but we've come up at our, our time of 5.30. So okay. um, we're gonna have to call it there, um, but thank you so much for just an inspiring talk and an inspiring Q&A. Um, uh, and for those in attendance, the talk will be posted later on the Harvey Mudd YouTube channel. So if you wanna watch or share, um, please feel free to do that. So thank you again um, for um, a great Moody lecture. Mike would have been very inspired and, and proud of this talk. And we're all so thankful for that and your, your clarity and the Im impactful nature of your work. Um, so thank you all for attending and joining us and we'll see you at the next Moody lecture for the 20th. Thank you.